You know, years ago when I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses going door to door preaching the end of the world, uh, I came across a scripture in the New World Translation. That's the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Uh, it gave me hope, yet it confused me. And I'd like to begin with that. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. And it reads there, uh, referring to Jesus, for no matter how many the promises of God are, they have become yes by means of him. Therefore, also through him is the amen said to God for glory through us. The promises have become yes. Well, that kind of confused me back then uh, because everything was off in the future. You see that, but, yeah. Yeah, but now I agree completely with what the Apostle Paul wrote there, and I can heartily add my own amen. Hello, everyone. This is Julie McAllen, back again with my friend Rob Pike for episode eight in the current series, which relates the Old Testament prophecies to the last days of the Old Covenant, not the end of the world. For several weeks now, we've explored the prophecy from Daniel chapter nine and learned that the Lord kept his promise completely as outlined in the prophecy. Uh, studying that really builds my faith, knowing that our Lord always keeps his promises right down to the very letter of his word. What do you think, Rob? Oh, I, I would totally agree with that. Uh, it, it was it was really awesome to uh, review that prophecy and, and how it was fulfilled over a course of 490 years. Yeah. And I know that I stated that after a brief consideration of, of uh, chapter 12 of Daniel's prophecy, we were uh, most likely finished with that prophecy last week. But in looking at it again through this week, I thought, you know, I really think there's some verses in here that uh, have some great significance that we need to consider more closely. And we know that the, the finality of this prophecy is that it wonderfully brought an end to old covenant Israel and ushered in a new covenant uh, under which we are living now. And in fact, when coupled with the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God, who John said takes away the sin of the world, it allows for us to be redeemed by his blood. In other words, we, we do now fall under this promise that we read last week in John 5, 24, which said, in solemn truth, I tell you that he who listens to my teaching and believes him who sent me has the life of the ages and does not come under judgment, but is passed out of death into life. That is a past tense event. So now I'd like to go back to Daniel. Uh, the 12th chapter once again and read these passages that I thought we ought to consider again because there's some awesome power in these verses that must be elaborated on Julie would you read that again Daniel 12 4 through 9 sure um, it says but you Daniel shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome? of these things. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Reading that passage, I think I see, I know, I think I know where you're going with this, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, when we look at verse four, we see something very important for Daniel is instructed to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. And we know when that time was because of the comment by Je uh, Jesus, don't we, Julie? 
Yeah, you're right, because Jesus mm-hmm. referred back to Daniel 9, 27, when he mentioned the abomination of desolation in his Olivet Discourse. Uh, he said, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, Matthew 24, 15 through 16. Uh, And the timing of this was during Jesus's ministry, which was sometime after the 483 of the 490 years, which you mentioned. Um, Thus, the time of the end would be that final generation mentioned by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. Yeah, and and, uh, that's Daniel, or I mean, uh, Matthew chapter 24, as uh, you have mentioned here, that whole chapter uh, and and chapter 25 goes into that. And since that generation that Jesus spoke of ended with the complete destruction of the temple, we know that it was once and for all the end of the old covenant age. And next we see a very powerful sworn statement by one of the angels that Daniel saw in the vision where he raised his hand, don't we, Julie? Yeah, and it's a very powerful statement because he gives the time frame for the completed end of the Old Covenant Israel. Yes, it does. But I I wanted to make sure that the audience catches the powerful significance of what was stated here because it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt when that time frame was, doesn't it, Julie? Yes. And Rob, I'm so glad we're reviewing this because it very clearly states that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. The holy people being spoken of here are those Jews who were labeled as God's chosen people for many centuries. And that's not speculation. Daniel was told the prophecy concerned his people, the Jews. But Rob, I know that many have said this is a reference to Christians, but is that possible? Well, no. I mean, think about this for a moment. The message in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 was sent directly by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. There was only one group of people at that time who could have been labeled as the holy people, and that was Old Covenant Israel. The followers of Christ were not even in the picture at that time. So furthermore, it states that when the power of the holy people would be shattered, all of these things would be finished. Now, we must reiterate the powerful significance of this. And how how does that tie to what Jesus said, Julie? Well, you're probably referring to Jesus's warning given to his disciples. Um, He said, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Luke 21, 20 through 22. Rob, this perfectly ties to a three and a half year period, which is the meaning of time, times and half a time in which the final siege of Jerusalem occurred. And in the end, the city, the temple, the entire system of sacrificial worship was just as the prophecy described, shattered, never to return again. That's right, Julie. So this was this was so important that I had to bring it up again, even though we did finish Daniel's prophecy last week. These two passages completely express why we understand without a doubt that Jesus did not say that some prophecy or part of the Bible prophecy would be fulfilled. He said all that is written would be fulfilled. And we believe this. Thus, the Bible prophecy has been completely fulfilled, all of it. And we are living in the Christian age, which has no end. Isn't that right, Julie? Absolutely, Rob. Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. Uh, We know that the Christian age has no end uh, because of the promise made earlier in Daniel's prophecy. He said in, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2, 44. So the shattering of the power of the holy people, which signifies an end, it can't refer to Christians, but just as Daniel was told, it meant his people, the Jews. It's 
powerful how perfectly this all ties together, Rob. Yes, it certainly is. And we know this because in the second chapter of Daniel, uh, right there where we where you mentioned, the course of history is actu accurately shown, showing a lineup of the world powers that would culminate in a time when Jesus would come to the earth. And Jesus would, during the last period mentioned here, state that the kingdom of God was now established because he said in Luke 17, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is coming, is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So he's, he, here he's t talking about something that's different than the kingdom that they had present at that time. And he stated something very profound in Matthew 21, 42 through 46 also. And uh, I think you have it right there, Julie. Would you read it? Yep. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. So from this, we see that Jesus was speaking about them and again about the end of the Jewish age. But this time from a little different perspective in that when this age ended, the kingdom of God would still be intact, but would consist of a different people. Yeah, and, and you know what you just said there, uh, read in that passage of scripture about the stone falling on the people, that's pretty much what Daniel said. So he's, he's make a, making a reference right there. In yes. other words, those followers of Jesus would be proclaiming the kingdom of God. I mean, it wasn't a, it was a kingdom that could not be visually seen. It was a more of a spiritual kingdom. And I just thought we ought to elaborate on this a little more before moving on to what some of the other prophets had to say. Yeah, good points. <clears throat> but with regard to, to that, I would just like for us to consider what Isaiah said about the future success of his son coming to the earth, because, you know, there are detractors who say, well, uh, they didn't accept the kingdom of God, so God had to put it off. Now, God said that this was going to happen, so uh, we have a passage of scripture which shows that <laughs> if he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen, right? Yeah, I think you mean Isaiah 55, 11. You want me to read that? Yes. Uh, it says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Rob, it's pretty clear uh, in what it says there. I mean, it just right out says it. Uh, whatever God sends out, it it accomplishes. It does not delay. It does not um, come back void. Yeah, and the reason that I wanted you to mention that is because there, is, there are a lot of people out there that are applying that his uh, mission failed, although they don't say it that way. They don't like to use that term. They just say it was put on hold for 2,000 years. So uh, I really believe that, you know, by saying such a thing, that they have to believe that God's not sovereign. I mean, that his word that went forth from his mouth didn't come to pass but it had to be put on hold because of something the Jews did. But this passage shows that God's purpose and his word will always succeed no matter what. So in the time that is left here, let's look pr uh, briefly at uh, uh, two of the so-called minor prophets to show that they weren't minor in scope. They were just minor because their books are small in the uh, Bible, but they did indeed have major messages relating to the old covenant. Let's first look at Hosea, Julie. What do we know about this prophet? Yeah, those minor prophets are often hard to find in the Bible. <laughs> Where is it? Because it's like two True. pages. But um, we learned that Hosea's name means salvation of Yahweh. He lived and prophesied about 800 years before the birth of Christ. 
the first three chapters of the book tells the story of his wife and children, which is a picture of Yahweh's relationship to the nation of Israel. Hosea's wife, Gomer, was unfaithful to him and ended up on the auction block to be sold. So that's how it relates, because Israel was unfaithful to God. Through all of the shame of his wife becoming a prostitute, Hosea still loved his wife. That's beautiful. His main goal was to redeem her, which he did by buying her back. Yes, he did. And the purpose of this story, as you alluded to here, was to show that when the Mosaic Covenant was formed, Israel entered into a marriage contract with uh, Yahweh. And the Bible history shows that Israel did commit spiritual adultery. And it, uh, in this case, they were speaking of the time under King Jeroboam that Baal worship was promoted among the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom. Thus, Israel was guilty as Gomer was. And for Baal worship, was one of the, it was known to be one of the most vile forms of worship known to God involving temple prostitution to the god Baal. So uh, looking at Hosea in uh, chapter 2, we see in verse 23, and I will sow myself for, uh, I will sow for myself, I'll say it right in a minute, <laughs> and I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. And we know this is similar to a statement that Jesus makes. It sounds a little confusing, but it's similar to what Jesus said. Isn't no, it? it's very familiar. In fact, Paul in uh, Romans 9, 25, he directly quoted from that because Jesus said at Matthew 21, 43, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. So the Israel of God is actually made up of followers of Yeshua from every nationality uh, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, uh, 13. Yes, we can say much more about this because we know that in this prophecy, we also have a promise that the people would be restored to the land of Israel after the Babylonian siege, which did happen just as we have been studying uh, with all the prophecies that we've looked at in the past. But in, and in the longer term, in his commentary, Albert Barnes noted of this passage, he said, at one and the same time were those promises fulfilled in Christ, the one through the other. Israel was not multiplied by itself, but through the bringing in of the Gentiles, nor was Israel alone or chiefly brought into a new relationship with God. The same words promised the same mercy to both Jew and Gentile, that all should be one in Christ, all one Jezreel, one spouse to himself, one Israel of God, one beloved, and that all with one voice of jubilee should cry to him, my Lord and my God. So, okay, Julie, so uh, we took a brief look here at Hosea. So who's next on this uh, list of lesser known prophets with major messages? I like that one voice of jubilee. That's special to me. <laughs> um, yes, well, the next prophet uh, we'll learn from is... Joel. Although we don't know for sure, there are some indications that his prophecy was between the late 7th and early 5th centuries BC. Um, Joel ministered primarily to the southern tribes of the divided kingdom. Uh, during the time of his writing, there was an extended drought and a massive invasion of locusts that completely stripped the land, leaving it devastated. And this disaster gave Joel an illustration for the judgment of God. Uh, just as the locusts were a judgment on sin, um, God's future judgment on the nation of Israel during the day of the Lord in the time frame of uh, AD 66 to 70 would far exceed that. Um, when that day came, God judged his enemies and blessed the faithful. And you know, Rob, Joel's prophecy of the last days included this one, Joel 2.28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. If that sounds familiar, um, yeah, 
Peter quoted from Joel in Acts 2.17 when the Holy Spirit was poured out. So this this was fulfilled in the last days. Yes, and we know that the, <clears throat> the day of the Lord was a major message of this prophet, and it refers to the ongoing judgment against the nation. Uh, particularly noteworthy are the passages in Joel 1.15 and 2.1. Both of them, we're, we're not going to read them, but both of them predicted a, a coming of the day of the Lord, which makes it think that it was prior to the first destruction of Babylon, uh, by Babylon, of Jerusalem. And in the second chapter, it speaks of the restoration of their fortunes after the judgment, which makes us think of the time when they were restored after the Babylonian judgment. But we know that the words you quoted place the fulfillment in the 40-year generation in which Jesus uh, uttered the words of the end of the old covenant Israel. So now we've come to the end of this lesson, Julie. Uh, any comments on your part? Well, Rob, next week we're going to look at some of what the prophet Isaiah and others had to say from the Old Testament. And I just want to give a shout out to our regular listeners. Um, thank you for your encouraging comments. Um, Jesus is Lord, and we live in covenant with him. Amen. So keep encouraging one another and keep yourselves in God's love. Sounds good, Julie. And, and yes, you're right. Uh, one of the uh, passages we'll look at next time is in Isaiah 2, 2 through 4 which uh, stated that the kingdom of God would be such that there would be no weapons of warfare. But once again, we'll see how this is not what most people think. So now, once again, as we close this episode, thank you for your comments. And I would like to say in finality, may God's grace be with you always. Have a great day. Bye-bye.